and welcome to the Douglas County Behavioral Health Forum. I'm Tiffany Stewart Stanley, the Director of External Affairs for Douglas County, and I would like to thank you all for participating in Douglas County Behavioral Health Month. I would also like to thank our sponsors. First, I'd like to thank our title sponsor, Greystone Power, Willowbrook at Tanner, Hughes Ray Company, the Douglas County School System, the Douglas County Chamber, Farmers Insurance, the Daryl Abernathy Agency, Harmony Wellness Angels, Cobb and Douglas Public Health, the Sigma Omega Omega Chapter of, chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Douglas Carroll Paulding Alumni Chapter of Doug Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, and Harmony Wellness Angels. Please give all our sponsors a round of applause. This event and Douglas County Behavioral Health Month was produced by Mr. Mark Lawrence of HLN Marketing. Please give him a round of applause as well. Thank you. <laughs> now we will have a few words from our presenting sponsor, um, from Ms. Vicki Harshbarger of Greystone Power. Good evening, everyone. So good to see so many of you here and so many elected officials. It's wonderful that y'all came out for this tonight, so thank you. As she said, I'm Vicki Harshbarger, and I'm Public Relations and Communications Director for Greystone Power. And Gary Miller, our President and CEO, wanted to be here with y'all tonight so much, but he had a prior engagement and he couldn't be here, so he wanted me to give you his regrets. Greystone Power is really proud to be a sponsor of Douglas County Behavioral Health Month, and in particular this event tonight, the Commissioner's Behavioral Health Forum. And thank you, Commissioners, for all you've done to get this going. Gary wanted me to express that we at Greystone appreciate the opportunity to help bring instrumental community partners like each of you together to dialogue about this most important subject, the mental health of our community. We understand the need for frank dialogue and meeting the challenges of behavioral health head on. We want to be proactive in this, and with all of us working together, we feel sure that we will be successful. So thank you for taking your time to be here tonight, each one of you, and I want to mention Mark Lawrence again and what a wonderful job he has done putting all this together for us in Douglas County. So thank you. Now I will introduce our host for the evening. Douglasville native and University of Alabama alumni Lena Harder is a model, actress, host, philanthropist, and entrepreneur. By day, she's an employee of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners Office, and by night, she works within the entertainment and pageant industries. Lena Hardy is the 2017 Miss Douglas County USA and will compete for the title of Miss Georgia USA this November. Please welcome Miss Lena Hardy. Thank you, Tiffany, for that introduction. Good evening. Good evening. It is a pleasure to serve as your host for this evening, and um, I look forward to speaking with you all tonight. Thank you for joining us. To begin, we will have our welcome by the chairman, Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones, chairman of Douglas County Board of Commissioners. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight and um, participating in this great event. Again, I'm Dr. Ramona Jackson Jones, Douglas County Board of Commissioners Chairman. And on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, we welcome you here tonight and we appreciate you being here as we uh, began to stump the uh, stigma of behavioral health in Douglas County. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to stand here tonight because it is one of my visions and this is something I wanted to uh, have as a stamp of approval for the citizens here in Douglas County as we move forward for this behavioral health event. This will be my signature 
for my administration, and this is something that needs to be addressed in the county, and not only that, not only at this county, but uh, Georgia, and also the United States at large. So again, thank you tonight for coming. Welcome, uh, buckle up. We have some great uh, speakers tonight, and uh, they will be sitting here tonight, and you will hear their point of views about behavioral health and what they could do and to contribute uh, to you and others that need support in terms of behavioral health. Again, thank you so much. Welcome on behalf of the Board of Commissioners. We thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Now we will have our address on why behavioral health awareness is so important by Kelly Robinson, our Vice Chairman of Douglas County Board of Commissioners. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Greetings. Yes. All right. All right, I, I, I've got a story to tell you some other time about how I got here, but um, it, it, there was no taxis, no Uber, no Link. It's 545. How did I get here? In 15 minutes. I'll never tell. But nevertheless, <laughs> I got here, and, and I don't drive, as you guys know. And we're going to talk about that just for a minute, actually, because if you think about mental health and its importance, Right? It's not just, it's easy to talk about our physical ailments. It's easy to talk about my eyes or when I tore my MCL at, 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 at one of our, our parks or something. It's easy to talk about that. But the stigma to talk about our minds and the things that may happen is that when you think about my life, I'm, I'm 50 years old, I mean, I'm at the top of my career and I gotta stop driving. Right? Wait, wait a minute, you know, I'm losing my sight that most people, my doctor said, it's too aggressive. You may not make it, we gotta buy you time. I need y'all to think about that. How does that impact your mind? I'm, I'm flipping through the different things from NAMI and the different organizations, and we talk about mental health. And there's one that says depression, and it hovers. It's not a respect of person, no mental illnesses. It's not a class thing, it's not a race thing, it's not a religion, right? It's not a gender. It's not a respect of person. So anyway, um, I'm gonna just give you sort of this whole backstory of what this is about. And they told me I got 10 minutes, and I promise I, I, I can do this. But it, it's one of those where, um, it, it, and I'm going to flip forward, um, to, it's, it's, I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to acknowledge everybody here um, in, in, in very short order um, in, in this story. That uh, when I came on board here in Douglas County, uh, again about eight years ago, um, I, I really didn't even know what this was about. Didn't even know what my call, what my purpose was, right? I was going through a divorce, right? Like, okay, Lord, you know, I ain't got nothing else to do. My, go, my boys are gone. Forty percent of my time is gone. Why not? Had I not went through a divorce, I would not have been in District Two to run for office. I would have been in District Three. Follow me. How life works. What do you do? And I say that to say is that through this walk, through this journey, I began to become clear about why I was here. So, so here we are. There's this story. There's a there's a slide should be up there called Vicky. All right, here's the story with Vicki. Vicki inboxes me on Facebook, and I'll be done in about a minute. She inboxes me and she says, Commissioner Robinson, my name is Vicki. Um, I pretty much have spent the last 23 years in state prison. I watched my mother commit suicide at the age of 18 years old. I didn't get proper help. Um, the rest you can go from there. It went bad fast, and she spent time. But she came back on the other side of this, and when this lady contacted me, we decided to go offline, you know, go beyond the typical, okay, now who are you, and so forth. And she got me on the phone, and she began to tell me about her story, and her journey, and her walk, and her commitment. It says people need to get help. Like, I, 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 if I would've got the proper help, if I would've got prevention or intervention at the time that I went through that, I would not be here. And she, is so, she was so, so impassioned by it. She moved me. I go to the ACCG conference in Savannah, Lo and behold, a conference that I'm going through right then says what? Criminal justice reform. I said, interesting. Let me see what happened here. And in that story, in, in, in that, let me turn this a little bit. And in that place, I, 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 I began to sit there. And I'm going to remember one thing this state official said to us when they were talking about accountability courts that were passed and the mental health courts and veteran courts. And, and, and this is what the one lady said. 
State officials says, the current model that we have is unsustainable, unsustainable. Now, it's about 200 people in this room. Now, look to my left and my right to my colleagues and said, did y'all just hear what she said? In other words, it was almost like the equivalent of the housing boom when somebody in, 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 up in the White House said, you know what, we're not going to make it. Right? And we have to do this. And it's pushed down to lower levels. And so I said that when Vicky, when I came back, look, I'm coming back from Savannah, from ACCG. I'm encouraged. I'm inspired. On my way in, I get off at the airport, coming up Camp Creek Parkway, stop at Starbucks, meet a friend who's got a book signing. In that signing, a lady comes up to me and she says, do I know you? And I'm like, I'm thinking she's talking about the author. So I backed off and said, you know, and here is. She says, no, you, aren't you Kelly Robinson? I said, yeah. She says, I'm Vicky. Like, small world. And then she says, so this is two months later now. It was January, now it's in April. I'm like, okay, all right, bet. I got it. In other words, sometimes you need a confirmation. I got the confirmation I needed. And so then it was within, what, 35, 45 days in May, we had a forum just like this. And it was the beginning. That Saturday, I decided to go out, and this, this is where I'm going to be finished with my story, to see, okay, let me check and see if this is really relevant. So I go to State Representative Roger Bruce his, um, of the 61st District, his catfish rodeo all the time in Sweetwater State Park. This is important. I go out to him and say, look, do you mind if I go around and sort of solicit people and tell them about this event? He says, yeah, just don't put them flyers all over the place, right? And I'm like, okay, yes, sir, no problem. So we went out, me and my sons, we go around and we're passing them out. Now, I need y'all to picture this. Right? Now think about one of the bark back parking areas with nothing but cars and stuff. My sons, you know, they're out there hustling, doing what they do as teenagers. Get them out. Next thing I know, the guy, the guy and the lady walks up to me and says, and see tears in her eyes, and she says, I can't believe you're talking about this. So I'm sitting here talking to her about this event that's about to come up, and I'm almost finished. Talking about this event, about what we're about to go do. And I look out at my corner eye, and you should have seen at least 30 people at different stages throughout the parking lot looking at this flyer. And you can just see the movement in, in, in the park that says, oh my God, we're on to something. And so I'm talking to this lady and my son was pulling me on my dad, dad, dad. He says, these people want to talk to you. I turn around, it's like a pastoral line of 15 people. Now that's not my call, but I'm like, oh my God, Lord, what have you shown me? Uh-oh, we're on to something. You know, think about what America's known for and I'm, I'm gonna close it out. America known for like, what is four, maybe five things. It's known for what? It's morals. America is known for what? It's military. America is known for its money, right? It's, it, what else is it known for? It's known for its masses, meaning the people. But also, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's what? It's malades, it's issues, melodies, it's maladies. We have issues here in America. In light of all that we are, we have issues, federal, state, local, et cetera. And I said all that to say that, well, what can we do about it? Do we really believe that mental illness should be addressed? Is it important? This forum is key for our future, right? We've got to carry it forward. We can't just have the illusion that we're about mental illness and mental health if we don't put real action behind it if we really don't find housing solutions that are sustainable, if we don't get education and access out there to the broader community, if we don't deal with that, then we're just, we're, 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 we're just sort of talking to ourselves. And that's not what Douglas County is about. We are better than that. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kelly Robinson. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. I yield the floor. Let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Let's give Commissioner Robinson another round of applause. Next, we will have a special presentation by the Chair of Douglas County uh, Legislative Delegation, State Representative Roger Bruce.
Hello, everyone. It, it's real important that, uh, that we at the state acknowledge and recognize the work that's being done here in Douglas County. It's, uh, it's an amazing uh, task to bring people together. Uh, it's a difficult task to bring them together on this subject because people really don't want to talk about it and they hesitate to talk about it. So as a delegation, uh, which I chair, uh, we wanted to at least acknowledge uh, the work that's being done. And I'm going to let Kimberly read this. All right. Recognizing October 2017 as Douglas County Behavioral Health Month and for other purposes. Whereas Douglas County Behavioral Health Month is designed to build awareness of and shine light on stress, trauma, related disorders across Douglas County and Metro Atlanta. And whereas a mountain prevalence of stress, trauma, and disorders in Douglas County and across Georgia necessitates the understanding and empathy of all in the sharing of quality information from mental health care professionals. And whereas throughout the month, the county's Stomp the Stigma campaign unites school, religious, military, psychology treatment facility, and legal stakeholders to supply the best information available to stress and, and trauma disorder survivors and those whose lives they touch. And whereas Douglas County Behavioral Health Month events include workshops, forums, school initiatives, and worksite wellness events, as well as free community holistic wellness services, including massage and yoga session. Now, therefore, be it resolved that October 2017 is recognized as Douglas County Behavioral Health Month. so much. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. This is definitely an honor for uh, Douglas County, especially on, again for the Board of Commissioners. We are very pleased and we are just excited. I spent 40 years of my life in health care, so I would be remiss to say that I, I retired from health care. I said my journey has just began and I want to just realize, make it very clear in Douglas County that we are committed to stumping the stigma here in Douglas and all over Georgia and all over this United States. So it starts with just one person at a time and then we'll all align and we'll go from there. Again, mental illness is, an, is a chemical imbalance in the brain. And uh, I've been knowing it a long time. I've been uh, in surgery, spent most of, that, of my time in surgery. I uh, have worked on brains and I know exactly what the brain looks like. But of course, we all have different thoughts and thought processes. But with us all together and working as a team, I know we can stump the stigma. I believe in us. So this is not only an honor for me, but it's for an honor for all the citizens of Douglas County. Thank you today for participating, and thank you again for coming out. Thank you. Next, we will have remarks by our Douglas County Sheriff, Tim Pounds. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's, excuse the dress. It was a training day for me, and I was going to go back home, put on a suit and tie as a note. I'm going just like I am, so y'all excuse the dress. But it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to stand here tonight for such a worthwhile cause. It's, you know, they say it's October is the month, but I hope this is the beginning of years on down the road. And it's not just a Douglas County problem, it's a worldwide problem. And as uh, Commissioner Kelly spoke a few minutes ago, that 30% that's in my jail is in my jail, and some of them I talk to, and uh, they don't belong there. But when a family give up on them, 
and then they go to committing a crime to support their little habits, then we got to arrest them. And then see like everybody that belonged to them go away. They just know they're in jail, they ain't worried about them no more. They know they're gonna get fed, clothed, and get their medication. So they ain't worried no more about that. But it's really start again, it started at home. We got the red flag that Kelly talked about. They do, they appear. We got to, we got to do something about it, ladies and gentlemen. And being born here, it just didn't start today. We've been at this problem for a long, long time. And I am so happy to stand here tonight being a part of what I hope get to fix the problem. Because it's such a worthwhile cause that I said it before. And pound the sheriff gonna stand in the middle of anything I can to assist them with the problem they have. Thank y'all, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, my name is April Owens, and I have recently attended um, two community meetings with the program of Stomp the Stigma, and that has to do a lot with uh, mental health behavior. Anything we basically go through that will have an impact in our life, traumatic experiences. Um, me, myself, you know, I am a survivor of that, as I call it, because I went through a traumatic experience, you know, when I was younger, my teenage years, all the way into adulthood, you know, where I was seeking different types of help, I, at least I call myself seeking, you know, really not knowing that they were there. So I really didn't pursue it. One of the things that I've learned is that, you know, we have to speak up and it's very hard. You know, individuals like us that go through certain traumatic traumas, whether it's depression, um, whether it's mental abuse, whether it's verbal abuse, whether it's domestic violence, you know, we have a tendency to just stay quiet. We don't like to talk either to family members or anyone. You know, we have so many different programs here in Douglas County, you know, in different parts of Georgia, you know, that we really need for teenagers, for parents, so you can know exactly how you can assist somebody when they are going through something. To me, how receiving help changed my life, it basically helped to shut down those voices in your head. A lot of the times when we are quiet, yeah, we're quiet and silent, but our mind is actually talking to ourselves, reminding us exactly of, you know, the things that whether you're not worth it, whether you're not enough, you know. So I see myself more active. I see myself talking more. I see myself, you know, giving advice more, you know. And it'll help me in order to open up so I can be a better mother for my kids, a better wife for my husband, and just a better neighbor, you know, for my community, you know. So help, you know, the help definitely helped me in order to be able to empower others and to open up and talk. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Danielle Bonich, as Ms. Lena introduced me, a licensed clinical social worker. I work at the Life Development Center um, at the church at Chapel Hill, as she also mentioned. Um, I've been there for two years, but I've worked in the mental health field for 14 years now. Um, I've worked at Devereux Treatment Network as well as Willow Brickett Tanner. Um, but I was given the wonderful opportunity to work in a faith-based organization uh, under the supervision of Pastor Jamal Baker um, approximately two years ago. And so now uh, my main focus and population that I work with is um, adolescents, um, adult females, um, and they mainly you know, suffer with anxiety, depression, um, and grief, things of those nature. So. Um, just want to put my name out there and let you guys know that I am available to you. So for the first two questions, these are going to be um, directed at state legislators, um, Senator Donzella James and state representative Roger Bruce. Um, and again, when uh, anyone responds to one of the panel questions, if you could just state your name and then respond um, for those of um, the audience that can't see your name. All right. So the first question is what legislation should the community be aware of for adults regarding behavioral health? And is there any poten potential legislation that we might see in the 2018 um, legislative session? Okay, you, you can go on the website of, of the state of Georgia and uh, go under uh, legislation and pull, and then go on to mental health. And you can see, it's probably about 10 bills but I'm telling you the one that I think is going to pass. This is going to be a short session because it's election time and everybody's going to try to get through the session to rush out of it. So the important uh, thing that they're talking about right now, because they had a study committee, 
is this particular task force. So get look at it and please get involved. Okay, well I, uh, I don't want to repeat all she said because that was very important, but some of the things that we're going to have to focus on uh, is, again, going after the governor to see if he will expand Medicaid in, in Georgia so that we can use that money. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that money can be used for mental health purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, the, I, mean, I see the sheriff has left, but the prisons are the primary place where people are getting mm -hmm. mental health treatment. They go to, uh, to they, go, they end up getting in trouble, they go to prison, they can get all the medicine there, they have food, clothing, shelter. That's where they're going to get their services, and that's not where they should be. But that's what's happening. The, the other piece of it is that when people get out uh, of prison, uh, or when they go in, they lose their rights. They lose a lot of their rights. And they lose their identification. And when you come out, you're trying to uh, get yourself reestablished, get yourself back involved in what's going on. And if you have a mental illness, you're probably not paying a whole lot of attention to where your driver's license is, you probably don't have one. Uh, so when you're going out and you're trying to get services, you can't get them because they won't give you the service without identification. And they won't give you the identification because you didn't have it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So we, we are looking at uh, opportunities to come up with a card or some other method of giving people a chance to identify themselves, not necessarily to use for vote or for other things, but just so that they can say, I am who I say I am. And uh, while that may not sound like a big deal, that is a huge deal mm -hmm. if you've ever tried to go get something and you couldn't identify who you are. Right, right. So, y'all told me I got two minutes, but I got about 40, 50 minutes worth of stuff. So <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Senators. Um, okay, so for the next question, that's going to be geared more towards the behavioral health professionals. The first question is, what are some signs of depression and anxiety, and what can we do if we think we are depressed or a loved one is depressed? <laughs> sure, guys. I, I think it's important um, to just keep in mind that no one's journey is the same, and no one's depression looks the same, and no one's... Um, anxiety looks the same. So it, it's hard to sit up here and say, if you see A, B, and C, oh, they're anxious, and if you see X, Y, and Z, they're depressed. Um, so what you want to look for are changes in people, drastic changes in people, or possibly things that just go on for extended periods of time. So if someone does start maybe isolating themselves or losing interest, um, in things that they were once very involved in. There are just some standard things to look for such as those, but again, just as Commissioner Robinson mentioned, there were no signs for his friend that, that went home and, and actually um, decided to take his own life. So it's hard, and, and you may can help me out, in terms of just saying what to look for. You really just want to stay in tune with people and take the time to ask them how they are. Um, we often flippantly just pass people in the hall and say, how are you? And they just respond, I'm doing well, and everyone keeps walking. We're not even listening, guys. We don't even take the time to sit and look someone in the face and genuinely ask them how they're doing today and take the time to sit and listen to their response. You'd be surprised what people are willing to share with you if you're just willing to take the time to listen. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that, um, you know, to, to say that, oh, look for erratic behavior or look for loss of appetite or look for a sleeping problem, you know, every case is different. But I think that all of us have the capacity to sense when something is, is off when we really slow down and are, are present with one another. And so that's probably the most important thing to address. So I think we, if you don't sleep well, you're not going to function well. Can we, can we all agree? If you don't sleep well, you're going to, mm -hmm. to function well. So if you notice that someone's sleeping behavior is different, they're up or they're sleeping excessively. So if I, you know, if I'm traveling and come back from Europe, I might be a little jet lagged. That's different than 
three days out of the week, four days out of the week, I'm sleeping excessively, or I sleep two hours per night. If I'm a well kept together person and you come and you see me and I'm you know just coming to the office and I look a little haphazard, that might be an indication to you that something is awry. But I, I agree with Ms. Thompson that if you take the time to just notice and be present and say, how are you doing? Because that, I think, you know, Commissioner Kelly's friend, he did, there was a sign. He said he got his affairs in order. When someone is suicidal, mm -hmm. they will get their affairs in order. Yeah. They will give away things. You will see them pull away. But we don't notice that if we're not present and take the time to not just pass people, but to be present in their lives and notice, you've been down lately. Usually you are on top of your game, but you've not been turning assignments in on time. You're like turning phone calls. Those might be indications, and so I think being present is one thing that we can do, mm -hmm. but also being um, aware of our own mental health. We often think of mental health, and I think we try to be, we try to be proactive in, in changing mental illness into mental health, but we also have to be mindful of our own self-care. That's right. If I'm not taking care of me, I'm not going to see what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. So part of it is taking care of ourselves first so that we can be present for other people. That's right, that's right. And I think, um, I think it's really important that um, you guys are just bringing to light the fact that it doesn't look the same for everyone. Um, and that, again, there are so many different resources out there um, to you know, just increase that community awareness. Um, I know um, a lot of you have different websites at the agencies that you work for, your own practices. Um, so we really encourage you to um, utilize those. Um, because there, yeah, of course, aren't signs in every single situation, but in most cases, there are. So, um, and we do have to wrap up at this time, but um, yes, just being present and being willing to listen and to assist with finding resources and answers if you don't have them, I think is a huge first step in the right direction. So, um, could we take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists and we're gonna... Thank you. Hi, I'm Patricia Wank, and I'm here today because of this being Mental Health Month. My family has gone through a tragedy about two and a half years ago. We lost our grandson, 23 years old. We lost Alex, and it was to suicide. He had a lot of challenges. There were things that he had gone through in his life that were very destructive. He also had a lot of different places that he had gone for help, but for some reason, whatever that deep part of him was still there. So many times someone is depressed and feel that they're a burden to the family that love and adore them. Um, <laughs> this is part's gonna be hard. So I felt like it was important that people understood that might be contemplating the fact that the your family and the world is better off without you. Let me reassure you that is not the case. The trauma uh, that my daughter went through, the trauma of having to call in the coroner, having to call in the police, having to call us at three in the morning and saying he's gone. She then went through all the hours of others in the house doing all of the work that had to be done in the room, the coroner asking her to please go somewhere else as they carried his body um, outside on a stretcher. Georgia is number six when it comes to United States in suicides. We have an epidemic. We have people that are lost, that are terrified, that are in places they don't know how to get out of. It's extremely important to understand as much as we can about the different areas of mental health. What we want to create is a state, a country, that is a positive mental health, not the destructive kind that we have. I hope this is of value to someone. I hope it changes someone's mind. And most of all, <laughs> I don't want anyone else to go through what we've gone through because it's, it's a forever 
journey after suicide. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Tracy Rickard. I am chair of the Douglas County Board of Education, and I just want to thank you. It was so difficult to see Patty give that um, testimony, and she's a sweet person, just a wonderful person in my life, and I just thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone for coming out tonight to be a part of this critical conversation that we must all start having in all communities. Um, before uh, an adult um, has behavioral challenges, their first is a child. So tonight we have composed a panel of legislators, specialists, and members from the legal community to discuss signs, intervention, and best practices to support those who may be on the cusp of or, or already in crisis. We just saw in the behavioral health spotlight the effects of suicide on families and um, what are some signs that a child might be, um, might be contemplating suicide? And I pass this out to any of the panelists. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think it's really important to understand that sometimes there's no signs. And for children where there's no signs, the greatest risk is if they're perfectionists and they have unrealistic expectations for themselves. Uh, so I think that that's a really important one. A second one I would tell you is that there has been a suicide in their circle because now they feel that it is an option mm. and it puts them at higher risk. I would tell you to read your behavioral health survey from your schools. Every single school will tell you the children who thought about suicide, the children who have attempted suicide. So it's important to look at your data and know what your data is. And lastly, one that's not really obvious, when someone picks a fight with you over absolutely nothing, they are distancing themselves because they know they have a plan and they will um, do things to put you off and to put other people off and create that distance. So just be aware of anything that's different. Um, I think that the first group, when you, when you asked them the question about depression, kind of touched on some of the warning signs of suicide as well. Um, what Judge Walker talked about when one suicide occurs to kind of watch that, that group. Mm -hmm. um, I am over the crisis response team for Douglas County and over the years we have responded at all levels. We have had suicides um, unfortunately <coughs> at, at, at the elementary level. We have had both student and teacher suicides at middle and at, at high school. And so when we send the crisis response team and we talk to that, we, we try to talk to the kids about suicide and warning signs. Um, I, I have seen sometimes some of the schools want to kind of sweep it under the rug. And I think that it's an opportunity for us to, to have that discussion with the kids. Um, we do the counseling immediately after and we kind of identify those students that are at risk that we need to kind of watch they come and talk to us and they're feeling mm -hmm. hopeless they're feeling depressed they're feeling anxious anxious an overwhelming um, feeling of sadness those are definitely warning signs um, some of the other things that you that I need to look for is they'll start to give their things away um, things that mean a lot to them um, they'll lose interest in things that they used to be very interested in and they, they used to be very interested in athletics and sports in music band and they'll quickly lose interest in that those are some of some of the warning signs you might see changes in their sleeping patterns where they'll be either sleeping not at all or sleeping all the time um, also changes in their appetite where you'll see where they they won't eat at all or they'll um, so again there are some of other ones I agree. I would also add, um, with any time there's been a relationship shift, um, a lot of times we think of, you know, elementary or middle school students go through um, being outcast or, you know, boyfriend breaks up with them just because they're so young, we kind of blow it off, with, it's their world. Um, so anytime there's been a major relationship shift, I would encourage uh, parents or teachers, whoever is there and can be with the student to check in with them a little bit more than you may think is important. Um, or also being outcast, being bullied, or being made fun of, because any, for any reason. Um, so anytime there's relational issues, uh, kind of uh, for elementary and middle school students, relationships are their world. 
So it's something that we should, as adults, take seriously, even though we know the world is much bigger than what they see, um, to consider that that can be a reason that they think they shouldn't be here and not important. Let me springboard from your comment about the bullying. Um, what can we do? It is an issue that our students, our young people have to deal with. And, and that's in um, K through 12 and even college, we see students um, contemplating suicide because of cyberbullying. What can we do to combat the effects of cyberbullying? I know that is one of the things, clearly, working with adults and girls, that we mm -hmm. to jump on that in ways that uh, we have to just be really, really aggressive, no pun intended, in dealing with cyberbullying. And um, <laughs> just in thinking back over the things that worked on, so three key takeaways in terms of what we did that has now become sort of evidence-based um, in terms of the model for gyms and that was first. Um, look at those bystanders. And um, we started to engage them as peer leaders, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we trained them in conflict resolution and de-escalation um, and also advocacy. Um, so advocacy training. And now some of them actually have gone on to be president of student governments at different colleges. So we're really proud of the work that we were able to do to get those um, um, young ladies from just being bystanders to actually being engaged in very effective ways. The second thing that we did was we started to treat the actual bully as a victim under most circumstances. There were some things that mm -hmm. were egregious, but in the most circumstances, we started to peel back the layers, and at some point, they were a victim, and now they were retaliating. So right. we had to, to really peel that back. And the last thing that we did was we had to address this broader, overprevailing um, since in our society of meanness mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, you know just violence just address that in general because it has become so normalized and we had to just really take back that power over the spirit of meanness in the atmosphere and in the environment where adults and girls all right, thank you so much, panelists. We are going to wrap it up, but I do want to say if any of you have questions, please, um, if, did you provide email addresses? If you place your names and your and email addresses on the cards provided to you, we will make certain that the questions you have, you will get a response back. So with that, can I get applause for these wonderful panelists? Thank you so much.